Hi everybody, welcome back to Moral Psychology with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. So today's lecture covers chapter 11 from our course textbook, which is all about character. And this chapter, by the way, is written by Maria Merritt, John Doris, and Gilbert Harmon. Um, I say the chapter is about character. Really, this chapter is about skepticism, about character and practical reasoning. Two ingredients that are very important in virtue ethics, as we've seen. And this chapter kind of uh, goes over some pretty compelling reasons to be skeptical about the role of practical reasoning uh, in our moral cognition, as well as uh, the existence of robust character traits that are taken to be a pretty important ingredient, along with practical reasoning, uh, when it comes to virtue ethics. So, let's get into it. So... As we've encountered virtue ethics periodically throughout the course, we've heard a little bit about how character is supposed to be important, the role the character is supposed to play. And the authors uh, summarize this nicely with their discussion of robust character traits. So virtues are supposed to be, um, or are, are thought of as robust character traits that are guided by practical wisdom or phrenesis. So robust character traits are not all there is to virtue ethics, but they're a very important ingredient. Uh, let's spell it out with an example. Um, so let's take courage, for example. This is, a, this is an example that Aristotle himself uses. Now, someone who possesses this character trait of courage uh, is expected to act consistently, courageously, when they're ethically obligated or when it is... Uh, ethically appropriate to do so. And not only that, but they're expected or can be expected to act this way in spite of reasons to behave otherwise. So since we're talking about courage, I mean, we can take, for example, a soldier who possesses this virtue of courage. Uh, that soldier might be expected to act courageously uh, consistently when it's ethically appropriate to do so, say, to come to the aid of his or her fellow soldiers or something. But they would also, or should also, be expected to behave that way when, uh, or rather, in spite of reasons to act otherwise. So in uh, extremely dangerous situations, this person wouldn't flake out, but would still act courageously in spite of the danger. So that's a concrete example. But we can make this a bit more broad uh, by framing this the way that the authors of this chapter do. And they say that... Um, uh, what we've just discussed when it comes to courage should hold for any other robust character trait. So someone who possesses uh, such a robust character trait, which we'll call T, can be expected to display, uh, excuse me, expected to display T relevant behavior in a variety of situations that are relevant to T, even when the situation is not conducive to such behavior. So Robust character traits are like standing dispositions to act in uh, ways that promote the good, even if acting in those ways is difficult, challenging, requires a lot of effort, and so on and so forth. Now, I mentioned that this is not all there is to virtue ethics. There's also practical reasoning, or phrenesis, uh, which we are going to talk about later. Um, but... Uh, I just want to say, this is not covered in the textbook nor in my slides, but the way these two are supposed to interact is, at least if you're like an Aristotelian virtue ethicist, is to help you identify the golden mean. And this is how you develop these behavioral tendencies or character traits, right? Let's go back to courage, for example. I mean, courage sits at, um, you know, this golden mean that Aristotle imagined between cowardice and between, like, rashness. Um, so we want to find that nice middle path, that this medium between two extremes. We don't want to be a coward, but we don't want to be so brash that we rush off, uh, stupidly and get ourselves killed for no reason, right? How do we find that golden mean? Reason, or logos, as the ancient Greeks would have put it. And of course, uh, learning how to determine what the best um, ends are and what the proper means to achieve them are. In other words, how do I behave and in what situations do I behave that way, right? How do I make sure I'm landing in that middle way and acting courageously and not 
uh, acting uh, cowardly or rashly, um, how on earth do I do that? Well, I use my practical wisdom, my phronesis, right? That's how these are supposed to interact. So the golden mean, something that's mentioned, or sorry, something that I'm mentioning now, which is not talked about in the textbook, but something good to be aware of since we're talking about virtue ethics. So um, what's the problem about these robust character traits? Um, why are we skeptical or why are the authors of this chapter skeptical about the existence of these robust character traits? Or if they're not skeptical about the existence of these traits, I, if we want to be a little bit less extreme with our reading, why would these authors be skeptical um, about these character traits, assuming they exist, playing a role in our moral cognition? Well, it has to do with the reasons... Um, it has to do, I should say, with findings from um, psychology, from experimental psychology. Now, some of these studies we've encountered before, uh, some of them we have not, but we'll talk about each of them in turn. But as we talk about them, keep in mind, these robust character traits are supposed to be standing dispositions, right? They're not whims or habits. Uh, they could not really count as virtues if they were just something... Uh, just ways that we acted, say, on a whim, right? Or if they were a habit uh, that I guess was uh, just behavioral and not tied to our reasoning in some way or another, our reasoning, you know, to find that golden mean, right? Um, so these are supposed to be these long-standing dispositions to display trait-relevant behavior in the appropriate circumstances in spite of reasons uh, to do otherwise, right? Um, and there's two ways we can be skeptical about this. We can deny that they exist, or if they do exist, we can deny that they actually play the role that virtue, virtue ethicists think that they do play. Okay, so whether you take that strong view or the weaker view, what are the reasons for taking either of those views? Well, they come from situationist experiments in psychology. So I'll go through the examples that are enumerated in the textbook of these kinds of studies. So in a 1972 study, Eisen and Levin found that subjects who had just found a dime were 22 times more likely to help a woman who had just dropped some papers than those who didn't find the dime. So these are, these are experiments that are done with naive participants and they're set up kind of in the wild, right? perhaps on a university campus, so no one's coming to a lab to do this experiment. Instead, we'll have an experimenter who plants a dime, and a passerby notices it. And if the passerby notices the dime, one of the experimental confederates will drop her papers, um, and then an experimenter who's watching from afar will see if uh, someone will help that woman pick up her papers. Now, in this study, what was found is that for the subjects who found the dime that was left there, they were 22 times more likely to help the woman who had dropped all of her papers than those who didn't find the dime. Interesting finding. What about this other study by Matthews and Cannon? This was done in 1975, and they found that people were five times more likely to help an apparently injured man who had dropped some books when the ambient noise was at normal levels compared to when the ambient noise was at much higher levels. So what they did here was they had, again, a situation probably taking place on a university campus. Um, I haven't read this original paper exactly, but uh, it's in some area where the ambient noise would be, I don't know, a bit like the, the quad at Carleton University, right? Um, before before this whole situation anyway. Imagine it's a lot quieter there now. In any case, uh, we've got people sitting around studying. There's a bit of noise, birds in the trees, very pleasant. And people are five times more likely to help an apparently injured person who's dropped some books. Uh, again, this is set up a lot like before. So we'll have a confederate who's dropped some books um, in, in an area a bit like the quad at Carleton University. And... Um, People are five times more likely to help an individual who's dropped their books in that situation compared to when there's, say, um, 
a gasoline powered lawnmower running nearby. So when the ambient noise is loud and unpleasant, people are much less likely to help this person who's dropped all of his books. Interesting. What else? Well, we've encountered this one before, Milgram's experiments, Milgram's obedience experiments. We'll talk about these in more detail later, and I have talked about this before. I've also linked in one of my previous lectures, um, I linked, uh, linked you to a video um, on the Milgram experiments. So I hope you've all watched that. Just in case you haven't, I'll put it in the video description of this video lecture too, so that you can uh, refresh your memories or watch it if you haven't seen it already. But Stanley Milgram found that uh, people would punish screaming learners. Um, they're called victims here, but in the experiment, the participants told that they were like a learner and the participants themselves were the teacher and they had to punish the learner for getting answers to questions wrongs, uh, getting these answers wrongs with electric shocks. Um, some of the participants went all the way up to what they believed was a lethal voltage level of 450 volts. Um, they protested, uh, but nonetheless continued, uh, carried on. I believe it was about, I can't remember exactly, it might have been about 40% of the experimental participants that actually went up to what they believed was a lethal dose of electricity. So, um, yeah, geez, that's, that's something. Uh, what else? Oh, we have the Stanford Prison Experiment here. So Haney et al. in 1973 found that students that were playing the role of prison guards in this simulated prison experiment uh, showed cruelty and abusive behavior towards the people that were role-playing as inmates. Really interesting. Um, and very relevant for today, as we'll discuss later uh, in light of recent events. So I will link you to a video about the Stanford Prison Experiment as well, because that's one of those classic experiments, along with Stanley Milgram's obedience experiments in psychology, um, that really uh, undermines this idea of robust character traits. And we'll see why that is shortly. Now, before we get into that, um, you might be wondering whether these experiments are really representative of how people actually behave in these situations. I mean, experiments like the Stanford Prison Experiment and um, especially Stanley Milgram's work were directed at working out how, um, you know, ordinary people could be made to do extraordinarily inhumane acts of cruelty. Stanley Milgram particularly was, was interested in how we could explain things like, you know, how does um, a regular old Joe um, end up as a senior officer in uh, the SS, you know, in the Second World War in, in Germany, in the Third Reich? How does somebody end up as a guard or a commandant at a, at a concentration camp or a death camp in Nazi Germany? right? Um, the death camps were, were not in Germany. They were in Poland, by and large. But uh, we'll say the Third Reich, right? How does a, uh, an ostensibly normal human being like you or I, um, how does someone like that commit extraordinary acts of evil such that we're seen during the Holocaust, right? Or like with the Stanford Prison Experiment, how do ostensibly normal guards or police officers commit acts of cruelty um, against those that they are supposed to protect, like racial minorities? Um, and, you know, in light of what's going on right now as I'm filming this uh, lecture, uh, this um, really speaks to the relevance of studies like this, together with other information and other findings that we'll discuss in later chapters. But how, how do we explain evil? basically, is what these experiments are all about. Um, the unfortunate thing is that uh, these experiments don't really show us behavior that's exceptional. They are representative of humans in a variety of different contexts, which is very unfortunate. And otherwise, um, uh, that is to say, um, you know, uh, the things we see people do in Milgram's study are, are not like um, 
abnormal, uh, abnormal uh, kinds of behavior. They're typical, unfortunately. Same with the Stanford Prison Experiment. And I'll even share another example uh, video of a little experiment was do that was done in a school classroom in the 1960s by a teacher that, again, speaks uh, very, very, uh, speaks very much to the point or, or, or is very relevant to what is happening right now uh, in the United States and around the world um, in relation to the death of uh, George Floyd. So we'll talk about that uh, more uh, as we proceed through this chapter. But um, studies like this show that um, people's moral cognition and, and the behavior that follows from their thinking about what is right and wrong is very easily influenced by situational factors, not robust character traits. And we've seen this before. Um, we've talked about studies like uh, the one done by Jonathan Haidt and Talia Wheatley, uh, where they hypnotized subjects and um, caused them to uh, feel disgust at, at like a cue word, such as the word often. And we saw how that could affect differential, uh, different moral judgments that they were making. There's the uh, Schnall study uh, that, uh, you know, has the fart spray in the dirty desk and made people uh, give harsher judgments um, about these moral vignettes they were presented with by making them feel disgusted, making the participants feel disgusted, I mean. So these behaviors do not seem to uh, result from robust character traits at all, it, whether we're talking about uh, somebody stopping to pick up a uh, stopping to help someone pick up some papers because they've just found a small amount of money on the ground, or whether we're talking about somebody uh, shocking a learner with uh, 450 volts of electricity or anything like that. These these behaviors do not seem to follow from robust character traits. They seem rather to be driven by situational factors like. Things that should be irrelevant to the situation, like ambient noise, or finding a dime, or being told to do something by an authority figure, as in the Milgram experiment, uh, where we had experimental participants protesting, sometimes vehemently, against the experimenter, and the experimenter would just politely request that they continue. You know, the experiment must continue, and they would continue administering what they believed were higher and higher electrical shocks to the learner. Um, so let's see if we can schematize all of this, right? Let's schematize skepticism about character. Uh, the authors do it like this, uh, and you can read about this on page 357 and 358 of our textbook. Uh, but they, they characterize it uh, in a, as, in a sort of syllogistically, right? They say, uh, for their first premise, if behavior is typically ordered by robust traits, Systematic observation will, re re will reveal pervasive behavioral consistency. So that is to say, if our moral behavior specifically is ordered by robust traits, then in, uh, in these carefully controlled studies, we should see consistent behavior, uh, you know, morally, morally praiseworthy or, you know, people doing the right thing, that, that kind of behavior. We should see that in these systematic studies. But as premise two states... Systematic observation does not reve reveal pervasive behavioral consistency. So the conclusion that they make is that behavior is not typically ordered by robust traits. And uh, it seems to me you can read this in a couple of ways, as I mentioned earlier. You can either deny that there are robust traits, or you can not deny that there are robust traits, but just that these traits don't seem to really play the role that they, that, that virtuous is this excuse me, virtue ethicists think that they do. All right, so before we uh, definitively try to answer, or if we can definitively answer the question of whether skepticism about robust character traits is really warranted, we should talk a little bit more about practical reasoning. So remember, practical reasoning or phronesis, if you're like a hardcore Aristotelian, uh, is all about reasoning correctly about practical matters. You know, we've talked about practical reasoning um, in terms of, you know, ex uh, the interaction of beliefs and desires, you know, in terms of a kind of instrumental reasoning sort of account. But uh, what someone like Aristotle would have meant by practical reasoning is working out uh, the best ends and the, then the means to achieve them. 
right? So something like prudence. Uh, this word is actually often translated as prudence. Um, <clears throat> so we have to recognize, you know, uh, how to reason correctly, uh, what the requirements of a situation are, how to cope with them, um, what courses of action are best supported by reason, so on and so forth. So uh, the example given in the textbook has to do with whether or not to take um, a, uh, uh, a medication that will induce uh, a, a powerful sense of nausea, right? So the first example goes like this. Um, should you take a drug that will cause you to feel sick, right? Well, um, a virtue ethicist might reason it out like this. It's shameful to induce physically degrading states in myself. And there's a group of people here asking me to take a nausea-inducing drug so that they can just see what happens. Maybe, um, maybe this is something like for YouTube or something. I don't know. <laughs> Some kind of uh, fail video. I don't know. But anyway, you're, you're a good virtue ethicist, so you conclude that you will not take the drug because it would be uh, shameful to degrade yourself that way for the views, right? But consider a modified example, right? Um, it's good to help other people given the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of us would agree with that. And here's a group of people that are asking me to take a nausea-inducing drug so that they can observe what happens as part of a clinical trial that's meant to help cancer patients cope with the side effects of chemotherapy, which can often induce nausea. You might then conclude in that situation, if you're reasoning practically, that you should take the drug because it's not shameful to help. You're not just physically degrading yourself. It would be morally praiseworthy to help other people, and this is a way that you could do that. So this is how practical reasoning is supposed to work, right? In these two different cases, practical reasoning, if it's working properly, should lead you to conclude that taking the drug is prohibitively shameful in the first case. Um, in the second case, however, it is not shameful. Most people would agree that it is the right thing to do. And if practical reasoning is working properly, this is probably what you would reason uh, in the first two cases. Although given the, uh, the kinds of things we see on the internet nowadays, um, people don't seem too concerned about that which is prohibitively shameful um, in any case. Um, in these kinds of situations, a virtuous person uh, is aware of what considerations are relevant, right? Is it shameful? Is it good? In the case of taking a, a, a nausea-inducing drug or something like that. So a virtuous person would reason about these kinds of situations in the ways that the textbook authors just have, or in the ways that I just have. A virtuous person probably wouldn't take the drug if uh, it was just a group of friends wanting to make a video uh, of their friend getting really sick to put it on the internet and in the hopes that it would go viral. That would be prohibitively, shame prohibitively shameful, excuse me, for a virtuous person. But in the second case, um, the person should take the drug because it's not just, um, you know, for the views or something. It's actually a, a scenario that could in the long run, help people who are coping with the side effects of chemotherapy, which can induce, um, can induce nausea, uh, very severe nausea, in fact. Um, so, uh, robust character traits together with practical reasoning are important when it comes to behaving morally for the virtue ethicist. But, and good practice, good practical reasoning is difficult. Uh, even if we weren't bad at it, uh, if we are bad at it, I, I mean, uh, ah, let me start over. Good practical reasoning is hard to do, all right? I mean, it's so difficult that maybe that's why we often fail at it. It's just really hard to do. Uh, the earlier mentioned experiments that we talked about um, might just show not that we don't have robust character traits, but that we're poor practical reasoners. That could also be what's going on. The answer depends on uh, what the empirical literature shows us, the authors of this chapter contend. Uh, that is, the answer to this question of whether, whether it's robust character traits 
not existing or not playing a role, you know, whether we should be skeptical about character traits in short, or whether we're just bad practical reasoners. Well, the answer to that question turns on what the empirical picture of defective rationality shows us. So, in other words, we need to look at experiments where reasoning goes wrong and look at how that accords with this philosophical picture that we've got of character and of practical reasoning. So that's what we'll do next. So perhaps there's some hope for character traits, but our practical reasoning just goes wrong. Maybe we're just bad reasoners. Um, when this happens, when... Um, morally arbitrary or morally irrelevant situational factors impede our reasoning and influence morally important behavioral outcomes, um, and even more specifically, when this causes people to behave in ways that contradict norms that they can be reasonably supposed to accept, this is called moral dissociation. That's what Merritt, Doris, and uh, Harmon call it, anyway. So moral dissociation occurs when these situational factors, which shouldn't play a role, affect our behavior in such a way that we behave uh, not in accordance, uh, contrary to moral norms that we should be supposed to accept as reasonable agents, right? Um, so let's talk about this idea of moral dissociation a little bit further. Let's break it down by going back to Milgram's uh, obedience experiment. So just to reiterate, again, uh, I'll have a video uh, linked to you in the uh, video description. You can check it out if you haven't already seen it. But in Milgram's obedience experiments, there was a teacher, and there was a learner, and there was the experimenter. Uh, the teacher is supposed to teach the learner by asking him or her questions and punishing them with what they believe is an electric shock. Bear in mind, no one was actually shocked as a part of these experiments. The learner was, of course, actually a confederate in the experiment. He was part of the experimental team, along with the experimenter, who dressed as a reputable-looking scientist with a lab coat and a clipboard and, you know, looked very authoritative, right? So... <clears throat> The teacher's asking uh, questions, and the teacher is the experimental participant. That's who we're recording data about. The teacher punishes the learner with electric shocks that become more powerful, they're led to believe, every time. And they'll increase in voltage, voltage, up to a lethal 450 volts. And the learner has to increase the voltage every time, or through every iteration, at the request of the experimenter. Now, Milgram reported that before the participants uh, actually did the experiment, uh, playing the role of the teacher, um, they uh, responded, 100% of them responded that they would deny the experimenter if they had to, um, you know, if they were asked to increase the voltage to a lethal level. And people surveyed about this experiment uh, indicated that uh, maybe only uh, one or two percent would actually obey the experimenter until the very end of the experiment. Of course, that's not what happened, right? Earlier I said I think about 40% didn't go up to a lethal voltage. Uh, I was incorrect. Um, Two-thirds of Milgram's participants obeyed the experimenter and carried on until the end of the experiment um, and delivered uh, what they believed was a lethal dose of 450 volts of electricity to the learner. Now again, the learner wasn't really shocked, no one was really receiving shocks. But the teachers, the experimental participants, believed that they were administrating uh, or administering these shocks to a person in the other room, which they couldn't see, but who they could hear. Uh, the participants reported feeling badly about this, but two-thirds of them nonetheless continued until the end. Um, now, we, uh, we can't do this experiment today, not on people anyway, for ethical reasons. Um, no one's actually getting shocked, but we're causing significant distress by uh, having uh, people administer what they believe is a lethal electric shock at the request of an authority figure. But... Um, in, 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 uh, in due course, since the publication of Milgram studies, these, uh, these experiments were replicated. Uh, we don't do them anymore, not with humans. We do them with robots and stuff. Um, 
but uh, they have not uh, they have not been replicated in recent history. But initially, they were replicated by many in North America and Europe and parts of Africa as well as uh, parts of the Middle East. So. Um, these results generalize across cultures, so it's not just uh, uh, you know uh, a Western thing, right? Uh, we found similar results going on in other parts of the world, which is uh, really disturbing. Um, so, what's going on here? Well, the authors of this chapter are putting forward the suggestion that. Uh, what Milgram observed in his obedience studies um, were paradigm cases of moral dissociation. You know, people behaving in such a way that contradicts norms like don't cause harm that reasonable people would be expect reasonably reasonable people should be reasonably expected to endorse. You know, norms of harm prevention, so on and so forth. Maybe something like this was going on, though. Um, maybe um, the participants are thinking like this. You know, it's good to contribute to society by, by participating in scientific research. So uh, maybe they're thinking that because their role in the present scientific research demands that they obey the experimenter, they will obey the experimenter and go ahead and deliver that lethal electric shock. Maybe that's what's going on. In other words, maybe it's authority that's causing people to, to morally dissociate in this situation. And that's, that seems to be the way that the experiment has been interpreted uh, by many subsequent to, uh, to its publication, right? Uh, this would certainly seem to explain a lot of uh, what I mentioned earlier. I mean, how does your quote-unquote average Joe go from average Joe-ness to... Uh, participating in atrocities like genocide in um, in the Second World War in the Third Reich, uh, well, could be authority. Um, you know, um, just think of the resurgence, for example, of um, of a lot of uh, racist views that are being endorsed openly online uh, nowadays. Um, Many people think that this may be because of a failure of moral leadership in, uh, in America right now, uh, where we have a president who uh, does not condemn or condone, you know, uh, figures like David Duke, uh, who are associated with racist, organiza racist organizations like the, uh, the KKK. Um, uh, in this case, uh, we don't have an authority figure so much encouraging overt racism, although I think it could be argued that um, the leadership in some way or another is encouraging a sort of implicit or covert kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, racism or prejudice. Um, <clears throat> so we don't have an authority figure saying, you know, go out and, and be uh, horrible to minorities, but we do have somebody who's not stepping up and telling people that that is wrong. And some people think that that could be a reason why we see so much of this hate online uh, coming out uh, coming out in the open now. Um, uh, let me know what you think in the comments. I think that's certainly uh, certainly a possibility. I mean, it's not that this kind of uh, racial animus wasn't there pre Donald Trump presidency. Uh, it was certainly there. Um, but it seems to be a lot more open and expressed a lot more unabashedly right now, which is quite disturbing. Um, and perhaps it's because uh, of a, a lack of moral authority. In any case, sorry for the tangent. If you have any thoughts on this, let me know in the comment section or send me an email or let me know on Discord. Anyway, uh, to recap, to bring it back to where we were, perhaps a chain of reasoning uh, that's centered on the experimenter's authority is... Is, uh, is what's going on here, you know? Uh, we, we could reason that it's good to contribute to society by participating in scientific research, and I don't want to punish this person with a lethal electric shock, but that's my role, and that's what the experimenter is asking me to do, so the conclusion is that you go on and you continue with the experiment. That's one possibility. Um, but a participant who endorses uh, the norms, the proper norms, the right kinds of norms that are pertinent to this situation. In, in, in short, a virtuous person who is um, 
should be expected to act to display trait relevant behavior like not causing harm and should endorse norms like don't cause harm um, should reason like this. It's wrong to inflict harm on an innocent person. The learner says these shocks are harming him and he refuses to go on. So the, the experimenter, experimental confederate who's being shocked, who the, the teacher thinks is, is in pain, uh, wants to stop and is expressing this. Uh, so uh, a virtuous person, you know, a person who has the right kinds of character traits and who's good at practical reasoning should stop. But two thirds of participants didn't stop. So how do we explain moral dissociation? Well, um, this kind of reasoning doesn't seem to have happened. In other words, the, 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 the proper practical reasoning doesn't seem to have happened in two-thirds of the participants. Or did it? Well, maybe the people weren't reasoning properly, right? We're bad at, we're bad at practical reasoning. So even though these people, these two-thirds of the experimental participants, if we asked them, would certainly endorse norms uh, about not causing harm. Uh, so, you know, they have that they adhere to the right norms, but maybe their practical reasoning just went astray in, in the way that we considered earlier. Or maybe they were deferring to authority. Or perhaps um, they just didn't realize that the second line of reasoning we considered should have defeated the first line. So the second line, you know, the learner wants to stop, so I will stop. That line of reasoning should have defeated the first line of reasoning on which, you know, it's good to participate in experimental research and my role demands that I harm this person, so I should do that. But um, it's reasonable, once again, to expect that the participants should endorse norms uh, that uh, are, are against causing harm to people. Um, and, and most of the participants reported feeling bad about causing or uh, feeling bad because they believed they caused harm uh, to this individual. And that's why um, this seems to be a case of moral dissociation, right? We have norms, you know, th these, these, these experimental participants do endorse the right kinds of norms, but they're not behaving in the ways that we would expect people that endorse those norms to behave. They're behaving the opposite way and they're causing harm, even though they should be reasonably expected to endorse norms against causing harm. You know, that's why this is called moral dissociation in any case. How can we explain this? Well, the authors have been focusing here on depersonalized response tendencies. A response tendency is a behavioral tendency that's, uh, and if it's depersonalized, that's because um, it, it leads to highly predictive uh, behavior um, where our reflectively endorsed values have little influence. So, uh, let me see if I can clarify that a little bit. So a depersonalized response tendency is a kind of behavioral uh, thing that we see in, in not just Milgram studies, but the other studies that I talked about at the beginning of the lecture, where um, these seemingly irrelevant factors lead to highly predictable behavior. Um, and not only that, um, our you know, ref reflectively endorsed values, you know, norms that we've thought about, considered, deliberated, reasoned about, norms like helping those in need or not causing harm to people, they don't have the influence in those situations that they ought to have. Instead, it just seems to be, as we'll see, a lot of automaticity and unconscious reasoning. So practical reasoning, the authors of this chapter suggest, can break down in the face of situations that invoke these depersonalized response tendencies. And those situations include, you know, finding a dime or having a, a, a pleasant level of ambient noise um, or being told by an experimenter to administer a lethal shock or playing the role of a guard in a prison experiment. Um, these lead, these all lead to these situational factors all lead to highly predictable behavior, and this behavior contravenes the norms that these very people um, endorse. That's moral dissociation. Um, so, I mentioned automaticity and unconscious reasoning. Um, let's talk about that now, uh, and what role that plays in this incongruity between 
uh, the norms that people reflectively endorse and these uh, behavioral responses that we see that are influenced by irrelevant situational factors. All right, so how does automaticity play a role in all of this? Well, let's explain what automaticity is. You know, what do I mean by automaticity? Well, most cognitive scientists and psychologists and philosophers nowadays agree that we can divide cognitive processes up largely into two different categories. Some are controlled and some are automatic. So controlled, process, uh, controlled processes are those that require conscious attention or deliberation. Um, and they're usually the kinds of things we have to carry out with limited cognitive resources. You know, we, they take up a lot of cognitive load basically. Automatic processes don't require conscious control in the same way. So um, my favorite example of an automatic process is the following. If you are a native speaker of English or even just uh, a fluent speaker of English but it's not your first language, try this right now. Try not understanding what I'm saying to you. Right? Try not understanding anything I've said. Unless it's, you know, a new technical term or, or a difficult thing, uh, you can't not understand what I'm saying to you. And, and imagine if we were just having a casual conversation, not about complicated philosophical or psychological stuff, but just about what's happening, how our days are going. You can't make yourself not understand what I'm saying. You can stop paying attention to what I'm saying, um, but if you're listening, you can't not understand what I'm saying to you. That's automaticity. The, the cognitive processes and perceptual processes that underwrite our language comprehension abilities are so automatic that we just can't turn them off. Um, compare that with a controlled process. A controlled process might be like trying to utter a sentence in a language that you are just starting to learn. Right? So let's say you're just starting to learn a new language and you're practicing speaking in that language. Uh, you probably have to think very carefully about choosing your words and putting a sentence together. So that's a controlled process in contrast to an automatic process. Now, many, many, many uh, of the cognitive processes that underwrite our behavior are automatic. Um, sometimes we can consciously intervene on those processes, but it takes effort. So think of like breaking a habit, right? Um, maybe you're trying to quit smoking, um, uh, and you might have this behavioral tendency to constantly reach for your lighter and your pack of cigarettes or something. Um, uh, you have to kind of consciously intervene, you know, it's, it's habit, just reaching for that. It's almost like sometimes you forget that you're not smoking anymore, I suppose, right? Um, we also don't have a lot of introspective access to these automatic processes. So what I mean by that is, uh, is that they are unconscious. Um, so to go back to the language example that I just mentioned, all the mental machinery that's computing, uh, you know, the meaning of the words I'm hearing and uttering and putting sentences together, following those rules for correctly combining words to create sentences are, 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 are unconscious. We don't have conscious access to those processes. So uh, that's another characteristic about automaticity that's very important to understand. So the authors are saying here, now that we've explained what automaticity is, that behaviors that are substantially automatic, which also contravene norms that we would consciously endorse are incongruent. So that's where we get this dissociation from, possibly, this moral dissociation between behavior and norms that we uh, consciously endorse. Um, does this pose a problem for virtue ethics? That's what the authors act, ask next. And why or why does, it, why does it pose a problem? Or on the other hand, why might it not pose a problem? I'll just say that um, this doesn't necessarily mean this incongruity um, owing to automaticity uh, clashing with our consciously endorsed norms. This doesn't mean that virtue ethics is necessarily a poor moral framework. Um, if, for example, and this is something that's pointed out by the authors of this chapter, if the relevant kinds of behavior are automatic, then maybe, maybe, being good 
uh, in a virtue ethics kind of way. It's just a matter of internalizing the right kinds of beliefs and practices, you know, having the right kinds of uh, dispositions to act in certain ways and making those automatic. That's one answer. So it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, virtue ethics is automatically bad, but it's hard to fit this with the empirical picture, uh, picture that we've already looked at. Um, another thing we haven't talked about uh, where, where you know, we, we really see this kind of incongruity is with implicit bias. And we have an entire chapter on race and racial, racial cognition where we'll talk about implicit bias. Uh, but basically, implicit bias is this idea that um, we, uh, we do not consciously endorse racial stereotypes. At least most of us don't. We don't consciously endorse these racist stereotypes. But we do have outgroup biases. So we are uh, sort of biased against members of, uh, you know, members of different uh, ethno-linguistic groups, possibly. So um, I'll talk about this in detail next time. But for now, just recognize that an implicit bias would be something that maybe comes out in our behavior, whereas an explicit bias is, you know, the kinds of things you'd hear from an openly you know, an open vocal uh, racist person, right? They might exclaim all these horrible things about uh, racial minorities or something. That's an explicit bias. So being like an overt racist is an explicit, that's explicit. Implicit would be like, well, I'm not a racist. I believe all people are equal. Uh, but perhaps unconsciously or behaviorally, uh, I can, we could see that I, I'm treating people from various groups differently. That's what the implicit association test is designed to get at. And we will talk about that in more detail uh, in our lecture on race and racial cognition. But that's another example of this kind of incongruity. And um, <clears throat> sure, we can try and make um, the right kinds of behaviors, uh, habits, or automatic, right? Um, but um, isn't that what we already try to do, right? We try to teach children... Uh, don't be racist, right? We, we, teach, we teach children, parents teach them, schools teach them, uh, community organizations, uh, extracurricular activities. And in many, many areas, children are taught not to be explicitly biased against other groups. But this implicit bias still shows up in implicit association tests. So that's troubling for virtue ethics. Um, something to think about in any case. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Um, uh, what I would like to know, especially if, if, you're, if you're so inclined to leave a comment, is whether you think that any of this really poses a problem. Uh, are you convinced by the experimental literature, um, or do you think that automaticity and incongruity, um, uh, even if they do pose a problem for virtue ethics, can this be overcome? Um, I'd like to hear about that. Uh, again, you know, uh, just let me know your thoughts, the comments, discord, uh, be a good way to get some discussion going. Okay. So, uh, that's it for automaticity. I want to talk briefly about other oriented attention and how that might play a role in morally incongruent behaviors and in cases of moral dissociation. All right, so another way that moral dissociation can come to occur has to do with the way that we kind of uh, tune ourselves or orient ourselves to other people. So um, one of the ways that we do this is empathy, obviously. And uh, during the, I think it was for the lecture on altruism, I shared a paper that tries to standardize the terminology surrounding empathy. So if you haven't had a look at that, um, do take a look. It, it's helpful here as well. Uh, you can find it on See You Learn. Um, but empathy is an emotional uh, resonance phenomenon. Not so much an emotion in its own right, that is, but a, uh, a way that we come to experience an affective state that is consonant with another person. So, you know, some person A, um, uh, their act, affective state might mimic B's affective state, right? And this could be caused by seeing them display certain emotions or believing that they're feeling in certain ways or so on and so forth, right? And empathy can manifest in a number of different ways, right? And this is discussed in the textbook as well in this chapter. Uh, 
you know, empathy can sometimes blossom into sympathy, maybe. Or maybe we can just come to feel sympathy without first empathizing. But sympathy is an emotional resonance phenomenon where one person's emotional response is similarly valenced to the others, but it need not be identical to the others. And sympathy also typically involves uh, uh, some concern for the other's welfare, where empathy doesn't need to have that. Now, th the terminology is not super straightforward here. I mean, uh, Daniel Batson does call sympathy empathic concern, but they're the same, the same thing, uh, right? But sympathy has got to involve uh, concern for welfare and some appreciation of what it's like to be in the other person's position. Um, contrast that with personal distress, however. Here you don't feel emotions for the other person. You feel them for yourself, and usually personal distress, as the name implies, is distressing, and it serves as a motivator for you to disengage from the situation involving the other person. So, um, one of the ways that we could understand what's going on in the experiments we've discussed is uh, perhaps a failure of empathy, where in, say for example, the Milgram experiment, people um, perhaps don't come to feel sympathy for, uh, for the people that they are shocking, or if they do, that's overridden, um, perhaps by the authority of the experimenter. Or in other cases, perhaps uh, by not finding the dime or by having uh, a lawnmower going in the background, these situ situational factors influence our behavior in such a way that we don't make that leap into sympathy when it comes to the person who's dropped all their papers or their books. Maybe it causes us uh, or primes us in such a way that we're feeling distressed and we want to remove ourselves from the situation. Um, I would like to hear some discussion about this as well in the comments section. I mean, um, do you agree with this uh, kind of failure of empathy take on what's happening? And if so, do you agree that um, the ways in which we empathize or fail to empathize or sympathize might pose a problem for a virtue ethics account of morality? I'd be curious to hear about that. So before we wrap things up, uh, we'll have a kind of discussion about what measures we might be able to take in light of what we've talked about today. Um, that is, in light of uh, moral dissociation and moral incongruence uh, as a result of these situational factors that should be irrelevant when it comes to doing the right thing. So there's, there's, there is, I think, good reason to be skeptical about the role of practical reasoning and the role of robust character traits uh, in our moral cognition. Um, so if you're like me and you worry a little bit that virtue ethics is in trouble because of all this stuff, then maybe there's some things we can do about that. And these are all discussed in, in, detailed, uh, in detail in the textbook. I won't go into all of the examples, uh, but of particular interest, um, are things like the Rwandan genocide, which is discussed here. I haven't discussed that today. I have discussed the Holocaust uh, very, very briefly. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that uh, the authors are thinking about here. They also talk about Abu Ghraib, uh, the prison um, uh, in Iraq where uh, prisoners of war were held by American forces. And as we'll see, we're... Uh, treated um, very questionably, to say the least. So, without getting uh, too convoluted here, uh, the author suggests that um, to protect, or insulate rather, might be a better word, against moral dissociation, we need to take measures uh, that, um, we need to take institutional measures and interpersonal measures to kind of um, help prevent these failings of practical reasoning, and character. Um, now, I think that many virtue ethicists would probably already uh, countenance something like this. So, I mean, just think about Aristotle, right? This is something I mentioned in my slides, that uh, in order to, to be a good person, we, we need a good society and good systems in society. And to have a good society, we need good people. Uh, it's a kind of 
uh, feedback kind of thing, I guess you could say. I mean, just think about it like this. The Nicomachean Ethics, which is like the keystone of Aristotelian virtue ethics, directly precedes Aristotle's book, The Politics. And The Politics is all about how to have a good society, and the Nicomachean Ethics is all about how to be a good person. In fact, Aristotle wrote it for his son, Nicomachus, so that he would know how to be a good person. So to simplify everything, yeah, the, uh, the ethics is about being a good person, the latter about a good society, but they dovetail very nicely. Indeed, you know, if, if, you're, if, 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 you're, if you're so inclined, you could treat them as one continuous work if you wanted to. Uh, so this, this idea that um, we can kind of insulate against failures of practical reasoning uh, and, um, you know, failures of character and moral dissociation, I think a lot of virtue ethicists would be on board with that. It's not really that dissimilar with what's been there from the beginning. So the kinds of institutional problems that I am talking about and the authors of the textbook are talking about are those that do not properly regulate the moral behavior of the members of that institution. So this is something that we see in the Stanford Prison Experiment, right, where uh, those that were role-playing as guards were, were just kind of able to mistreat those that were role-playing as prisoners, and there was no regulation over their behavior, right? And this happens in the real world, too. Um, this happens, uh, for example, uh, not just in... Um, you know, wartime situations, although we'll get to that in a moment. This happened, uh, this, this happened for years in the entertainment industry. Uh, that's what the Me Too movement has been about, right? Where we have people who were um, behaving in sexually inappropriate ways and there were no institutional checks against, the, against these people, like characters like Harvey Weinstein, who held so much power um, and were able to exploit that power uh, in order to exploit vulnerable people sexually. Um, and it got to such a point that there had to be a mass movement because there were no checks in, uh, there were no institutional measures in place to prevent this kind of thing. Or at least if there were, they were not sufficient, apparently. Um, particularly relevant to today are institutional, uh, instances of institutional violence committed by the police against members of racial minorities. And this is... Uh, obviously something that um, this issue has has been ever present in, in, in America and probably largely to, to one extent or another in Western society uh, for a very long time. You hear about a lot in America with respect to black communities. We have the same problem here. Uh, let's, let's not pretend that we're morally superior to our neighbors south of the border. I mean, we do have the same problems here. Uh, with uh, all kinds of minorities, and I would argue uh, particularly towards the Aboriginal communities of Canada. Um, indeed, our former institutions, um, I'm talking things like residential schools, were, didn't just fail um, to regulate moral behavior, but actually promoted immoral behavior by encouraging uh you know, the, the, the schools were meant to remove, uh, uh, were meant to remove their language and culture, essentially committing cultural genocide was what happened. Um, very unfortunate. Um, so we can have institutions like that, that are, you know, not, uh, not failing to regulate moral behavior, but actually condoning and encouraging immoral behavior. But, you know, um, think of the institutional violence, um, uh, that's a result of, you know, like, uh, the violence that's a result of institutional problems and things like police forces, right? Where, um, there's not just implicit bias, but explicit bias, um, and not enough is being done. In fact, I would argue the opposite, especially if you look at American policing forces, where we have an over-militarized police force, and, um, I've said this in conversation with many people recently, but if you, if you take, you know, your average Joe and give them that power, the power to police, to arrest, and give them the, the tactical gear, the weapons, you're just not going to behave the same way that you do 
when you're not in uniform, when you don't have that amount of institutionally backed power behind you. Um, so the police are, are kind of over militarized and other, other things are underfunded and, and, and under, underutilized like social workers and, um, and things like that. So uh, the example in any case to move on from, from what's obviously on everybody's minds today. And by the way, it's incredibly um, moving to see. Uh, it's incredibly moving to see people organize in the face of, of, of this kind of institutional violence and systemic violence and to advocate for the kind of systemic for reform that's been needed. Um, George Floyd's only the most recent case. I mean, there are many, many other cases of police brutality committed against minorities. Um, and, and it's, it, it really like, I, I, I don't mean to get all mushy. I really don't, but it is, it actually has been very moving to see uh, people standing up and getting organized um, and trying to, to address these institutional failings. Um, oh, so the example in the textbook is, um, is the Abu Ghraib prison facility, which spells it out, I think, pretty succinctly. Um, there was institutional failure a failure of institutional standards of conduct for the military, arguably in the case of Abu Ghraib prison. I'll put pictures of what some of the guards were doing to the inmates at Abu Ghraib here that are also in my slides. So this was a top-down failure. We had uh, the boots on the ground, as it were, um, uh, violating the rights of, of these inmates. And yeah, I know you're saying these are enemy combatants, uh, terrorists. I mean, human rights need to be respected. I mean, what are we fighting for, right? If we're supposed to be the good guys, how can we be the good guys if we're, if we're torturing, if we're treating people inhumanely? We're not the good guys if we're doing that. And that's what happened in Abu Ghraib. This was a top-down failure, the authors point out, um, that came right from the Sec Secretary of Defense at the time uh, in the United States, Donald Rumsfeld, who, for example, asked, you know, why are you making these detainees uh, oh, I'm paraphrasing here. He actually said, quote, uh, you know, he was asked by detainees, uh, asked, sorry, asked why detainees could be forced to stand for only four hours a day when he himself often stood for eight to 10 hours a day. That was apparently taken as license to uh, just do whatever uh, they wanted. Um, you know, uh, sleep deprivation, um, the, putting filth in people's food, having people... Uh, stripped down and um, just awful, awful stuff. Um, soldiers, of course, and this is, this is not meant to, this is, this is not an anti-military thing that I'm doing here. Um, a lot of the members of the military that I've known in my life have been absolutely upstanding. Um, the problem is that um, all of the things are there to make sure that uh, or all the, there are things that are supposed to be there to make sure that soldiers continue to be upstanding when they're in these situations where there is a high chance of moral dissociation happening. And in the case of Abu Ghraib, this broke down from the top all the way down to the bottom, all through the chain of, chain of command. So I don't know. Um, let me know what you think. If cases like Abu Ghraib or if what's going on right now um, with all of the protests against uh, systemic racism and systemic injustice in, in the police uh, forces and, and in the legal system, uh, do these all suggest that uh, institutional measures are not sufficient to uphold good moral behavior? Or, and this is what I think, do you think that there are measures that we can still take? I'm optimistic that there are. I can't lay all of them out now. That's not what this lecture is all about. But I think that we have come a long way in terms of addressing institutional failures like police brutality, but we've clearly got a long way to go. We clearly have not dealt with implicit bias nor explicit bias in, in, in entirety. Clearly we haven't. Otherwise, these kinds of things, like what happened to George Floyd recently, would, would not be happening. Now, I know this has been kind of a 
kind of a heavy one, but I would love to hear your thoughts either way. I think this would just be a good opportunity to get some discussion going. And don't limit to yourselves to the examples I've just brought up now, like Abu Ghraib or uh, what's going on presently in the world. Um, you know, this is where we have to, this is one of those discussions where we kind of have to confront the darkest elements of humanity, right? When we have to talk about things like residential schools or the Rwandan genocide or the Holocaust. Um, and we have to try to understand how these things happened. If we all think those are horrible uh, and we, we don't endorse, uh, we don't endorse that sort of thing. And we endorse norms contrary to those kinds of things. And I'm not that much different from the next guy and, and, and the next guy and the next guy. Then how is it that these things come to happen? Uh, it's really a serious, serious issue, something that we have to contend with. That we are contending with, but nonetheless, that we obviously, arguably, have much, much more work to do. All right. Well, um, this was a heavy one. Um, we haven't covered everything in the chapter. That's all right. Um, but I hope that you will discuss some of this in the comments section and think about it uh, with yourself, with your friends. This is the right time to have these kinds of discussions. Uh, and I think they need to be had. I think this is one of those times when psychologists, uh, moral philosophers, moral psychologists, cognitive scientists, we really have to come down out of our ivory towers and talk about this stuff at times like this to prevent similar things from happening in the future. So um, I hope you keep thinking about all of this. I hope you keep discussing it with, with those that you know, those you care about. Um, the next lecture... Um, Oh, once again, I've forgotten the next lecture. I think it's well-being, although it might be race or racial cognition. Um, you know what? It'll be a surprise. I'll upload it once it's finished. Uh, I'll have to take a look at the syllabus just to remind myself. In the meantime, I hope you're all staying safe out there. I uh, hope you're studying all of the materials. Um, I've just put up the third quiz, so don't forget to check my announcement on CU Learn, um, and I will see you for our next lecture. In the meantime, take care, everybody. Bye for now.